Let's all stand together. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It is a gift to lift up our voices in song.
everyone. My name is Claire Eltsy, and I am one of the ministry residents here. And I'm just so thankful to be able to come and gather and worship Jesus alongside you guys this evening. If you're a guest here, we have info booths out in the lobby. If you want to stop by, they can answer any of your questions. And for everyone else, if you're interested in finding more ways to connect or want to know about the history here of our church or about the ministries here or meet some more staff, we have Belong. And Belong meets on the first and third Sundays of every month at 1030 in room E202. Now here at Berean, we believe that as we follow Jesus and become more like him, it's something that we're meant to be doing alongside other people, not something that Jesus intended for us to be doing alone. And here we have two environments for discipleship, gathering in these large worship services and then in life groups. And in life groups, we take what we learn and we apply it into the context of our everyday lives. So whether you are looking for maybe making this big space feel a little smaller or you've just eagerly been awaiting life group signups to open, now's your chance. Our spring session which is seven weeks, is open for registration. You can check it out on our app or our website. And with a new life group session also comes a new slate of classes to supplement our growth. These classes focus on men, women, marriage, theology, care and support, and many more things. 
So you can also take a look at our app or website for those and see if there's any that we offer that interest you. It's a great opportunity for you guys individually or as a group to gather and learn and grow in a more targeted area of your life. And I'd also like to encourage you, if you want to contribute to the work that God is doing here at Berean, to look at the ways on the screen to give. And I'm going to go ahead and pray for us tonight. God, we just thank you and praise you for who you are and for being a faithful God who is so loyal to your plan and purpose. We've seen how loyal and faithful you were to the Israelites despite their sin and their stiff neckedness. And God, I just thank you for your faithful ways and sending your son to be a savior and to complete that plan so that we can be in relationship with you. And I praise you for being faithful right now for all of us, whether we are going through joyful times or sorrowful times, that we can lean into your faithfulness. And I pray for our evening here as Ryan comes up to teach that you would be leading him in truth and opening our eyes and ears and mind and preparing our hearts for your word. I also pray for Christ Place Church tonight, Lord, that they, this weekend as they gather, would their body would be encouraged as they hear about the wonderful works that you've done for them and that they would take that and join our mission to go out and make disciples, Father. We just sit here with thankful hearts. Amen. Let's all stand together.
prepare the way.
So which type of person are you? You're the kind of person that likes to keep expectations in life very, very high. You like to go on trips. You like to kind of build up hope and anticipation and expectations. Or are you the kind of person who likes to keep your expectations low? Don't want to be disappointed. Let's just make sure that those expectations are rock bottom. I probably fall into that latter category, and I'll admit it's probably a bit of a defense mechanism. Don't like to be disappointed. But I think all of us in the room can admit that expectations are things that have incredible power in our life. When expectations aren't, when they aren't met, it's incredibly disappointing. And for many of us, we would say that when our expectations are met, it often leads to frustration and angst for us, and maybe even in our worst moments to anger and we lash out. Expectations have a lot of power. So here's a question for you this evening. When you first came to Jesus, what did you expect your life with him to be like? What were you expecting? Maybe a better question is the one that follows upon that is, When he didn't meet your expectations, what did you do with that? What do we do when Jesus doesn't meet our expectations? That's what we want to consider this evening. So open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 19. We're going to be in verses 28 to 48. Now this is the eve here of Palm Sunday tonight. This is... Uh, Essentially, the the day that 2,000 years ago initiated all the events that would lead to Jesus' death, would lead to the moment that we just heard about, about the wondrous cross. Jesus is on the eve of that march, heading towards Jerusalem. But he has around him a group of disciples, a growing number of disciples, and they, in this moment, know they are headed to Jerusalem, and they are filled with hopes and anticipation. They have high expectations. They are looking forward to this trip because they hope this is the trip that will change everything. And so we pick up the story in Luke 19, verse 28. It says, after he had said these things, he was going ahead, going up to Jerusalem. So, of course, every time we jump into the middle of a book or the middle of a text, we have to do a little work to kind of provide some context. And so here, of course, it says, after he said these things, and the question becomes, what things? What things did he say? Well, Jesus had just finished telling his disciples a parable. That's what came before in Luke chapter 19. Jesus taught in parables all the time. It was one of his favorite forms of teaching. And at their most basic level, parables are kind of this long extended analogy that ultimately meets common assumptions or kind of expectations head on and turns them often upside down. Jesus would teach in parables, and most often the theme of his parables was either what God is like or what God's kingdom is like. He'd start a parable in a familiar way. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. He would say the kingdom of God is like. And so in Luke 19, Jesus knew that his disciples were full of expectations. And specifically, what they were hoping is that as they were on the way to Jerusalem, They were full of expectation that Jesus was going to march into that city, was going to grab the Romans, kick them out, and they were going to usher in a new earthly political kingdom that would be on par or way greater than anything that existed before. 
This was going to be the restoration of the Davidic kingdom, only it was going to far surpass any of that. That's what they were hoping for. They were going to march into the city, the city of God, and Jesus was going to climb up to the throne. And so knowing that's what they were thinking, he told a parable, and what the parable essentially said is that what they were hoping for would come eventually, but not yet. Not yet. It wasn't going to happen in the way that they wanted or in the timing that they wanted. And so his call to them was to live faithfully as faithful citizens of the kingdom as they await this moment that is in the future when the kingdom will be fully realized, it will be culminated. And what it meant to live as a faithful citizen of the kingdom was to live as a faithful disciple of Jesus, to learn from him, to seek after him, to follow him, to have their very character be transformed into his likeness. But we all know the power of unmet expectations. And I'm sure for the disciples at this moment, this would have been a struggle. It would have been a struggle to come to grips with Jesus' warnings, kind of him trying to temper their expectations. He was saying the kingdom is coming but not in the way you think, and not yet. It's not going to be fully realized. And they struggled to come to grips with that because they so longed for it to happen. Rome were a bunch of invaders, and that is not what God intended for his people. And they were longing for that to change. They were longing for God to have his way fully in the world. They were longing for God's ways to be done and for his kingdom to come and for it all to be a happily ever moment. That's what they longed for. They longed for the kingdom. They wanted it now. And many of them were very willing to help Jesus however they might. They'd grab a sword if that's what he needed. That's what they were looking forward to. And so Jesus tempers their enthusiasm. But then, as the story continues, he starts to do some things that had to kind of put them back on the edge of their seat because he starts to do some things and say some things and act in some ways that certainly make it seem like this is the arrival of a king into the city of kings, into Jerusalem. Verse 29 says, when he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So even today, if you were to go to Israel and you'd be in the northern part of Israel, the area of Galilee where Jesus did most of his ministry, and you were to travel to Jerusalem, you would travel down the Jordan River and then you would get all the way south through that floodplain to the city of Jericho. And once you reach Jericho, you would turn west and start heading up towards Jerusalem. It'd be a long ascent. Jericho sits below sea level and Jerusalem sits up in the mountains. And so it would be a long, arduous climb. It'd be a tough trek, but it was a trek that pilgrims in that day made over and over again as they made their way to Jerusalem. As you were making that trek, a 14-mile trek, when you got about two miles away from Jerusalem, you'd come upon the cities of Bethphage and Bethany. Now, Bethany is a city that we're familiar with because often when Jesus would be doing ministry in Jerusalem, he'd kind of set up camp in Bethany, kind of be his headquarters, and then he would go into the city every day. We know that city as well because it's the home of Mary and of Martha and of Lazarus. So that city sits just down the hill from the peak of the Mount of Olives, and just over the peak is Jerusalem. So now as Jesus was approaching these two cities, he sends two disciples ahead and he says, go get a colt upon which no one has ever sat. Now one thing when you read Jesus, one thing I want to encourage you to do is always read about his words and his actions as if he knows precisely what he is doing and he is doing it with great intentionality all of the time. Everything he says, every question he asks, every action he takes, full of meaning, full of purpose, full of intentionality. 
I used to read Jesus and kind of think of him more as kind of, he's just kind of wandering the countryside and doing miracles. And that is not the case. Jesus was in charge. He had a plan. He had a plan. And that is certainly the case here. There would be two reasons that there would be a young animal, probably a donkey, a foal of a donkey. There'd be two reasons that it would be unridden at this point. It would be either because it was being kind of kept for sacred use, maybe a rabbi would ride it at some point, or it was kept for royal use. Maybe, just maybe in some very, very special circumstances, it was being saved for both uses, for sacred use and for royal use. So in anticipation of the concern that certainly the owners or whoever's looking on would have as these disciples are untying a donkey that isn't theirs, Jesus tells them what to say. When they ask, just say, the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. I love that phrase. When I was a missionary, I used to have to ask people for money, and there would be times where I just wanted to say, the Lord has need of it. You know, Jesus has that right. I don't have that right. <laughs> In some ways, it, it's just a statement that, that Jesus, his purposes supersede any reason that the owner was maybe setting aside or, or hoping or saving this cult for. Whatever this cult was being saved for, all of that is now superseded and overridden by Jesus' purposes. This cult really had met its purpose. Its purpose was to be caught up in what Jesus was doing on this day. So Jesus is acting with great intentionality. And what he is doing in this moment as he is asking his disciples to collect this young donkey is he was intentionally preparing to fulfill a long foretold prediction of what the Messiah and the King of Israel would do. It was a messianic prophecy spoken by the prophet Zechariah 500 years before Jesus' birth. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, Zechariah said this. He said, Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus had made this trek before. He made it multiple times from Jericho up to Jerusalem. He wasn't tired. He wasn't weary. It wasn't that he couldn't make the trek and he needed a ride. No, Jesus was making a very significant intentional statement. It was this. The king is on his way to Jerusalem. The anointed one, the long anticipated one, the Messiah of Israel, the one who would save his people from their sin was on the way to the city of God. A king is bringing salvation. Oh, but this is a different kind of king. This is a royal and sacred king. One who is great and mighty, but one who is also humble, mounted on a donkey. So as we look at it now, looking from where we sit, knowing the whole story, we can see the tension that Jesus was constantly trying to kind of help his people navigate helping them live in this tension of what was coming, but also what was yet in the future. But we have to understand for these disciples, being human as they were, there's no way in this moment that they could, they could possibly contain their, their excitement, their anticipation. Jesus is doing all the things they hoped he would be doing. He's, he's riding the donkey. He's fulfilling prophecy. And so they continued to march up towards Jerusalem. And their hope and their fervor only grew. Verse 32, so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. So these two disciples did just as Jesus told them to do. They went to the town. They found the colt. They untied it. And as they were untying it, of course, the owners said, hey, what's going on? What's going on? And they said, the Lord has need of it. 
It's very interesting. You might only see it in your footnotes, but the the word that is translated owners is the Greek word for lords. The lords own that cult. They were that cult's earthly master. Oh, but the Lord, the one who has the rightful claim to everything, he showed up on the scene. And his lordship, his kingship, overrides their earthly ownership of this cult. So the two disciples brought the young donkey to Jesus. And then the crowd joined them in this moment full of hope and anticipation. And they placed Jesus on the animal and they laid their coats on top of the donkey to serve as a saddle. And then they took their coats off and laid them on the ground, creating a royal red carpet proper, appropriate for the arrival of a king into a city. So it's an act of honor, an act of submission, an act of honoring the king, but also saying that even even their clothes, even their coats belong to him, and and it's, it's fine, and he's worthy to ride over their coats. He has every right to everything of theirs. Just an incredible scene. It's hard to capture the drama. We don't know exactly how large that crowd was, but we know that through Jesus' action and through the the clear response of the crowd, it was very obvious what the message was. Jesus is the king, and he is on the move. He is on his way to Jerusalem, the political and the religious capital of Israel. Verse 37, as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, The whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So the Mount of Olives sits just to the east of the old town of Jerusalem. The old town kind of is... Is, comes to an end on the east edge of the Temple Mount. And from the Temple Mount, then there's a valley. It's called the Kidron Valley. And then from the Kidron Valley, it starts to climb up. And at the top of that ascent, you have the Mount of Olives, the peak of the Mount of Olives. If you can imagine a photo of Jerusalem, it usually, the photo that we see most often is one that's that's taken from the Mount of Olives looking west, looking down on the Temple Mount, and now there's the Dome of the Rock. There's other things there now, but it's, it's a photo from the Mount of Olives looking west. So in a moment here where it seems like the geography of the land, right? They've just climbed this huge mountain, made this long journey from Jericho, from below sea level. They've reached the peak, and then Jesus has crested the mountaintop. And as he comes over the mountain and starts to descend, he sees the city spread out before him. The city of peace, the city of kings. And in this moment, it seems as though the fervor of the people matches the geography of the land. They too are hitting a peak moment And in that moment, they burst out in shouting. They burst out in song. They begin to sing a song that would have been sung by by pilgrims throughout the centuries in Israel. They begin to sing Psalm 118, a song that was sung by pilgrims as they entered into the city of Jerusalem. It was a song of triumph. The psalm describes a king leading his people into the temple and leading them there in order to worship God and and bring about the very peace of God, singing songs of joy, praising God for what he has done, what he has done in sending Jesus, the miracles that he has performed, but also now singing that the Messiah, the king, has entered the city. Maybe all will be right with the world very soon. Oh, expectations couldn't be higher at this moment. Jesus had already worked to correct their expectations, to to kind of temper their hopes, help them see things in proper perspective. He had just done that with the parable and what preceded this moment. He said it was going to come differently than they expected. It was going to come at a different time than they expected, but they struggled to understand it. They struggled to understand it. At this moment... All these disciples knew is they liked what they were seeing. This was good stuff. 
This is exactly the way they hoped it would go. They liked it, at least most of them liked it. Jesus had a knack for really provoking strong responses throughout his ministry. If you think of his ministry, it seems like people always have this polarized response. They're never indifferent to him. They either love what he's saying or they just hate what he's saying. So as the scene continues, we learn that there were some present that didn't like what they were seeing at all. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Now, we don't know if these Pharisees were maybe some of the hesitant disciples among the Pharisees that decided to kind of follow Jesus. We aren't sure. They could be that group. It could be the group of Pharisees that kind of like to tag along in Jesus' crowd, kind of as religious spies, hoping to catch him, saying something wrong, catch something that they could pin on him and ultimately get rid of him. We don't know exactly who they were, but we do know they did not like what they were seeing and they didn't like what they were hearing. In their mind, this was blasphemous stuff. Who does this guy think he is? The king, the Messiah? He needs to put this to a stop. But Jesus, in answering them, turned to them and said, listen, if I stop them, the stones will cry out. What they are doing is absolutely appropriate because I am the king. I could try to stop them, but if I stop them, it would do no good because in the chasm, in the void, in the silence, all of creation would cry out because I'm the author of creation. What they're doing is just right because they are speaking what is true. They're speaking words of reality. The king has arrived. The king has arrived. For weeks now, Jesus has been heading towards Jerusalem. And now in this moment, he's right outside the city walls. He's almost there. And in this moment, make no mistake, the disciples were ready to not only continue the ascent into Jerusalem. They, were continue to, they wanted to continue the ascent all the way to the throne, right? Let's take Pilate. Let's get him out of here. Let's get Jesus on the throne. Let's do this thing. And Jesus knew that. And he also knew what the future held in this moment. He knew that in this moment, things were going to change quickly. And that's why in this moment, he didn't join them in rejoicing. He had a completely different response. Verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. I don't know exactly all the expectations the disciples had, but I know one thing. They were not expecting their king to begin to weep. Began to weep and it says something deep about what this king is like. This is a different kind of king. Jesus saw the city, the city that really had been kind of the focal point of God's blessing on the earth, right? It's the place where the temple dwelled, where God's presence dwelled in that temple. And he looked at that city and he wept, and he wept because he knew what was to come. He knew the cross was only a few days away. He knew that although he was the king, he would be rejected by the leaders and by the people. And so he entered the city knowing what was to come. And he announced over it what was to come for them because they had rejected him. He spoke words of prophetic announcement, words of judgment, announcing the coming downfall of Jerusalem about how that city 
would be torn to the ground as a result of the leaders and many people in Israel rejecting him and his ways. He said, if you had known, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace. I think it's safe to say everyone in Israel wanted peace. And great kings and great kingdoms operate in peace. They bring about peace. Oh, but Jesus' peace wasn't going to be delivered by means of overwhelming military power. That's the way the world seeks after peace. The peace that Jesus spoke of and that he offered is the peace that, that would not be the product of treaties or domination or one nation kind of throwing down or kicking out another. Rather, it's the peace that God intends for his world. It's shalom. It's the way things ought to be. A people surrendered to God is a peace that comes about when there has been a heart transformed such that the very character of God is embodied in his people. Transforms relationships. And transform relationships, transform then communities, and communities transform cities, and cities, states, and states, countries, and countries operate in peace together. This is a different kind of peace that Jesus offers, all brought about not by the sword, but brought about by, by the inward transformation of the heart that is available through Jesus and through his gospel. Jesus, through his life and ministry, through his words, through his proclamation, and ultimately through his, through his death on the cross, made a way for peace. He taught the things which make for peace, and he offered it freely to anyone who would place their faith in him, who would surrender their life to him and follow him. But it wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't what they wanted, and so they rejected him. So he tells of their destruction, the destruction that will come upon them because of their rejection. He says they didn't recognize the time of their visitation. God, God incarnate, the son of God, the anointed of God, the rightful king entered into the story. The author of life entered into the story and was rejected. Reminds me of that just tragic statement in the gospel of John as John talks about Jesus appearing in the world and he says he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. It's unbelievable. God entered the world. The one that Israel had been longing for, in fact the one that the whole world had been longing for showed up on the scene it was the moment that everyone had been waiting for and they missed it because their expectations were that he was going to take over a political kingdom. He was a different kind of king. And that's why he wept. Sadly, we know that the prophetic announcement over Jerusalem did come to pass. It was in the year AD 70. And it was the very people that the disciples and the people wanted him to cast out. It was the very people, the Romans, that they longed to expel, that ultimately fulfilled this prophetic announcement that took the city of Jerusalem down to its bare bones, brought about the very judgment because they rejected the author of life. They rejected the king. So as this triumphant but very surprising Upending expectations procession continues. Jesus continues into the heart of Jerusalem, but he doesn't go where we think he might go. He doesn't go to the royal palace. He doesn't go to some governmental building. No, he makes his way right to the heart of Jerusalem, to the temple. Verse 45. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all those who were selling saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging onto every word he said. In a moment that certainly is reminiscent of the prophets of old. 
Jesus enters into the temple, the place where, where God's Holy Spirit once dwelled in the Holy of Holies. And he cleansed it. He brought into stark contrast what was happening there versus what God intended to have happened there. He says the leaders had made it into a robber's den. The question is, how had they done that? And the answer is that they had neglected prayer. They had neglected letting the nations in, letting the people come and worship God. They had neglected the things of God. And then they had essentially hid in the temple. Think about what a robber's den is for. Right? A robber's den is where people who rob go to hide out, to not get caught, to seek cover. These leaders, they were, they were defying the very things of God. And then, as a cover for themselves, they were hiding under the immunity and the authority of the temple. They were hiding under its authority that they might not get criticized. They were using the temple as a shield, kind of a, a safety net for themselves. It's a robber's den. And Jesus entered. He told them what the temple was for. It was supposed to be a place of submission to God. It was to be a place where, where people learned about him. It was to be a place of communion and prayer. And so that's just what he did. He began to teach began to teach about what God is like, what his kingdom is like, as he always had. And the people, oh, so many of them hung on his very words. Others, well, they began to plot in earnest how they were going to destroy him. King Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, and his arrival was one that upended everyone's expectations. So those of us here today, we sit here on the eve of Palm Sunday and we know what Palm Sunday holds. We think about Palm Sunday, but we also know that Friday is just around the corner. We know the triumph of this moment is going to quickly turn into the tragedy of Jesus' betrayal at the hands of Judas. We know that this king, this one that we just claimed came in as king, that he is going to hang on a cross on Friday afternoon. We know that. But the disciples, they didn't know that in this moment. Oh, but Jesus, Jesus knew that. He knew every bit of that, and yet none of that reality of what was to come changed one bit of the fact that as Jesus entered that city, he entered as the sacred king. He entered as Messiah. He entered as the anointed one. The one that was going to change everything. And make no mistake, as you walk through this week, know this, Jesus was in charge the entire time. This was his very plan. He knew what was coming. Oh, he and his father had planned the cross long ago. He was completely in charge. And he knew the cross was his very unexpected coronation. He knew what was to come. No one was expecting it. See, his is a different kind of kingdom. Because he is a different kind of king. So when you came to Jesus... What did you expect it to be like? Were you expecting it to be easy? A removal of everything troublesome in the world. It was going to be easy from here on out. All downhill from here. That's the way you came. Surely then you've walked through life somewhat disappointed. Maybe even disappointed with him. And so the question is, on, on the, when that happens... When disappointment with him rises up about what's happening in your life, what, what do you do with that? Well, on this day 2,000 years ago, some of the people looked at him and the way he was not meeting their expectations and they decided they had had enough. They had had enough and they got rid of him. Others, though, others hung on his very words. And in so doing, they submitted to him as king. 
They submitted to him and they let him determine what his kingship would be like and what his kingdom would be like. Their expectations were set aside. He's the one that gets to name exactly how it's going to go. What's it look like to submit to him today? Our world's seen a lot of great kingdoms come and go. And most of the time, the greatness of a kingdom and the greatness of a king is measured by its power and its size and maybe its wealth. That's what the world thinks about power and about greatness. But Jesus, he is no normal king and his kingdom is no normal kingdom. And his kingdom, his kingdom, the kingdom that all of us are citizens of, it has been spreading for 2,000 years. Spreading in unexpected ways. Oh, most kingdoms, most kingdoms spread by overwhelming power. His kingdom spreads through the proclamation of the good news, through the power of the Spirit, through hearts being transformed, and through acts of service and sacrifice, all motivated by love. Oh, most kingdoms want to ensure that they have an adequate number of soldiers. His kingdom is all about raising up a kingdom of priests, priests that have been transformed into his likeness and then represent him to the world. Most kings, uh, most kings rule by fear of death. Jesus, this king rules because of his death. His is a different kind of kingdom because he is a different kind of king. Or when you came to Jesus, I don't know, I don't know what you were expecting. But here's what I do know. The type of king that he is, unexpected as it might be, it is exactly what you and I and the world needs. And so what can we do? What can we do but submit to him? to bow down, to put our expectations aside, to name him as king, and to say to him, all hail Jesus' name. He is the perfect king. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you that you, in your wisdom, sent your son into the world to reign as king and to initiate the very kingdom of God. That he triumphed on the cross that we might be full citizens of that kingdom. And so we ask you, help us, help us by your spirit to walk in a manner worthy of the kingdom we've been called into. Only you can bring that about in us, and so we trust you with it. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the king that is above every king. Amen.
Savior of the world. God, it's our privilege to worship you. What else can we do but respond to you in all your glory? We praise and worship not only with our voices, but with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everybody. Thanks for coming to worship with us this evening. Go in the power of the resurrection.